Welcome to the first of six webinars addressing the challenges we're all facing in finding the right people to fulfill our respective missions. My name is Joanna Truitt, Executive Director of AEA, the Association Education Alliance, of which your company is a member through your association membership. Displayed um, are all of those associations participating in this series. And it's a pretty impressive display representing many different industries. Each of these associations is a member of AEA, which as you probably know, is a consortium of distributor focused trade associations. Most of you might be familiar with its most popular program, the University of Innovative Distribution, which will be held in Indianapolis, March 21st, 24th this year. And we're very, very excited to be back in person with UID. I do have the pleasure of introducing your presenter for the series, Alex Tchaikovsky. Alex is a highway, uh, highly experienced market researcher and analyst with more than 20 years of expertise across subjects, including economics, industrial manufacturing, automation, and advanced technology trends. For the last two decades, he has consulted and advised companies throughout the US and Canada, Europe, South America, and Asia. Alex is currently overseeing a suite of analytic products focused on talent for the Miller Resource Group. He is also consulting with companies like yours to help them build better um, and become better at attracting, hiring, and retaining the impact players in their industry. Through this series, you'll hope to impart some of what he's learned and what his company is finding through their analytics uh, in this six part series. So Alex, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Joanna. It is a genuine pleasure for me to be here uh, presenting to the AEA audience, um, although in a slightly different role than you might use to seeing me, but I hope to, as always, deliver the practical and actionable advice that you have come to expect from me, which will hopefully in this particular case, help you become a better um, player, if you will, in the war for talent. Now, I was a little bit hesitant about using that cliche war for talent, but I can tell you in the six months or so that I've been dedicating to researching what's going on in the job market right now, I really have not been able to find a better and more apt description of how competitive the dynamics in the workforce environment are right now. Companies are literally fighting for talent, not just amongst their peers in their industry, but amongst similar companies that also look to um, develop and hire uh, a particular skill set across a spectrum of industries. And so it's a really fierce competition if uh, war is a bit much for you, but certainly um, having the right tools, uh, the right ammunition, if you will, uh, and having the right partners in this war for talent is going to be a key element and a key theme that I hope to impart on you throughout this series that we're going to be uh, embarking on together over the next year or so. So I thought I would start the um, story for you with a little bit of an update on the job market, but I'm going to talk about it not as an economic perspective, but rather as a recruiting perspective. So this first slide that I'm going to share with you right now shows you how different the labor market is relative to the pre-pandemic timeframe. You can see here prior to the start of the COVID-19 uh, virus really spreading in that March, April of 2020 timeframe, we had just under 164 and a half million people in the US labor force. And although we have had somewhat of a recovery, even today, that number still is quite a bit below where we were pre-pandemic at 162.3 million. So what this means is that the labor force has declined by more than 2 million people over the last give or take two years. And yet despite that, we still have an unemployment rate of 3.9%, which is phenomenal. It's one of the lowest that we've had in quite some time, certainly matching the lows that we um, saw prior to the pandemic and really highlighting how tight of a job market it is. While we have this dynamic shift in the number of people participating in the labor force, we also have a huge surge 
in the number of job openings. So you can see here in this next slide that we are currently, as of December of 2021, that's the latest available month of data because it usually runs about a month behind, we're at 10.9 million people, of, I'm sorry, positions that companies have listed on various sourcing sites. And that number is historically at an unprecedented levels. We, you, you can see here, if we look at the past 20 years or so, there is quite a, a bit of variation in these data, but typically we're somewhere between 4 million and even at the height of the pre-pandemic surge, 8 million, we've never been near 11 million people. I'm using manufacturing here as an example to, to drive a, a, an important point home that, um, again, you're certainly competing with the likes of other companies within your vertical, within your region for the talent that's available. But you're also competing with many other sectors. And you, you can see here, I'm, uh, I'm using manufacturing as an example. Manufacturing jobs have a lot of the same skill requirements and education requirements as construction jobs and professional business services jobs. And yes, even some jobs in healthcare, particularly in the area of the job market where most companies feel the pain most acutely, which is on the blue collar side, the production employees, the hourly staff, there, there, you're also competing with restaurants and hotel and the retail trade sector. So the name of the game uh, when it comes to talent acquisition is so different today than it was even running up to the pandemic that you have to make a very clear commitment to changing your approach to how you attract, how you hire, and how you retain staff. You can no longer apply the same strategies and the same uh, approaches when it comes to all of these uh, elements of a comprehensive talent strategy. And that's exactly what I want you to think about this because uh, I've, I've really been surprised when I've been exploring and researching the labor market about how few organizations dedicate the necessary energy, effort, and time to attacking this problem, which, you know, despite the fact that many companies say that people are their number one asset, uh, it oftentimes is relegated to, well, that's an HR department issue. I'm going to let them take care of that. So when we try to put these two things together, the uh, amount of people in the labor force and the number of job openings, we get a very interesting ratio. This is the number of unemployed per job opening. And you can see right now that number sits at 0 0.6, which is a historic low. Let me break that down for you for just a minute. So that ratio is plotted as this dark red line over time. You can see I'm going back to the pre-Great Recession timeframe to make my point here. So before the Great Recession, the ratio hovered somewhere around one and a half. So that means that for every job opening, there were one and a half people looking for work. That means that it's a, it is an employer's market. They have the pick of who they want to fill those positions. Then certainly as the Great Recession ravaged our country, we had that ratio skyrocket. You can see it reached about six and a half in late 2008 before beginning a long and uh, gradual process of drawdown all the way through the 2014, early 2015 timeframe where it came back to that pre-Great Recession level for the next several years, so 2015 and 2016, we're right back around that one and a half unemployed people per job opening ratio. Then in 2017, th something began to change. And we saw that this ratio started to decline again, eventually during the course of 2017, dropping below this very important one line here. So that means at that point, we started to have fewer people looking for work than there were positions, but it was still relatively close. And many of you felt the tightness of the job market in 2018 and 2019, you can see when the ratio was hovering somewhere around 0 0.8. Then here comes the pandemic. We have a very short-lived search and then a very quick recovery in terms of employment. And you can see for the first time in late 2021, that ratio actually dropped below the red line. So when I say that the job market is in unprecedented territory, this is exactly what I'm talking about. There are simply not enough people to fill all of the positions that are available. And the variety and choice available to people when they're picking their jobs is also much greater than it used to be before. So I think you have to take that in context and understand that if you are still doing the interview process the same way as you were before, 
that can't fly anymore. If you're still making um, compensation offers based on, well, we've always paid this position this amount and we're not going to change now, that doesn't apply anymore. Certainly not to the extent where you're going to be successful in getting the top-notch candidates that you're hoping to attract to your organization. And everything from metrics and retaining people, culture, all of these things that you've heard about for many years, it requires your attention. It requires the realization that the name of the game has changed. And if I don't evolve, evolve as an organization, I'm going to be very much left behind. So when we think about all of the disruptors that we've lived through over the last two years, the job market is clearly one of the standout illustrations of how different things are right now. Because in addition to the changes in the labor supply, which I just reviewed with you, we also have massive shifts in people's approach to work in general and what it means for you as an employer and an organization. Um, just a couple of examples, the whole idea of hybrid and remote work, that's obviously something that all of you are battling right now. When people have a lot more options available to them, they're going to pursue some of those options. And so uh, many of you that have positions that simply cannot go remote are struggling because some of the people that used to be um, willing and, and able to come in on a daily basis are now saying, well, I have the option of only working in the office two to four days a week now. Uh, why would I not do something like that rather than having to be in the office every day? It's a really tough uh, field to navigate. In addition to that, we have the ongoing drama related to the various surges and the, uh, the, the vaccine mandates, certainly the variants that we're dealing with. There are certainly people that are hesitant as a result of the pandemic uh, to come back into the workforce full time the way that they were uh, prior to early 2020. And I think another, uh, certainly something that should not be overlooked is the impact on your business from the inflationary environment and what that means to the expectations of the wages that you pay to your people. Um, you know, inflation was somewhere around 7% last year. Uh, on average, the wages increased in this country about four and a half percent. So most workers, felt an erosion in their purchasing power. And that's certainly driving a lot of the behavior that causes people to look around and to consider other job opportunities. So when you take all of these things together, it really shows how seismic of a shift there has been in the environment when it comes to the workforce in general, and more specifically, in the way that you should be approaching talent in terms of both attracting them, hiring them, and retaining them. And yet, as I mentioned earlier, few companies actually do something about that. Now, there are some that are trying, but according to the latest research that I've conducted, most, the majority of organizations, when asked, do you have a talent strategy? The answer is no. Now, the good news is that a lot of them are starting to realize that that's an important component of their overall strategic plan, and they are in the process of reassessing. What does our HR infrastructure look like? How do we implement some of these initiatives that we know we've been behind on? Uh, but the vast majority, you can see 75% nearly still do not have a talent strategy. Only 27%, according to this data, which polled hundreds and hundreds of companies, say that, yes, we do have one and are actively working on it. What this means to me is this needs to be a very clear call to action. If you can ask yourself, does my organization have a talent strategy? And by that, I don't mean uh, we have an HR department that deals with this plethora of issues, but at the executive team level, we are involved day to day and we're willing to commit the time and the resources and the planning in order to not only address the challenges we have with talent today, but also to lay out a roadmap of what we're going to be doing one year from now, three years from now, five years from now, that's the approach that you almost have to adopt in order to be successful with the job market being what it is. Because if you don't, again, the companies that are doing this are clearly going to get ahead of you on the attractiveness scale in terms of their ability to retain talent, and you're going to feel the pain much more acutely. It, it, it is no longer okay to remain the status quo as you were prior to the pandemic. You really have to reassess everything. So when you talk about a talent strategy, really a comprehensive one, there are three pillars that you really have to address. First is the A in AHR, that's the attraction component. 
you have to think about how do we convey the message effectively? How do we understand that many people have different priorities when they come to our organization? How do we market ourselves and, and let people know about the open positions that we have? Is it through traditional means like job sites or do we do something different? Is our website attractive? You almost have to do an assessment, an audit, if you will, of how effective you are at attracting talent to your organization. And wherever you see pain points, wherever you see you falling short, you've got to enact a, a plan, a strategy, and uh, monitor for continuous improvement. Because if you can't measure it, you won't be able to track improvement. And that's a key element to all of this strategic thinking. The second part of AHR is the hiring practices. You have to realize that many organizations, especially small and medium-sized companies, which make up, I know, the majority of the association membership of the of different groups that make up AEA, you have, I mean, a lot of different holdover uh, practices. For example, multiple interviews uh, where the candidate is asked the same questions over and over and over again. A lot of times the GM or the, the, the owner of the business is also the main HR person. And so they will put up an ad, they'll get a bunch of applications, and then they'll get distracted. And it'll be two or three weeks before they even reach out to people. That simply won't fly anymore. You're going to lose out on candidates if you're doing that. So a reassessment of your hiring practices and asking yourself, is this kind of just the way that we've always done it? Or are we trying to be best in class when it comes to our hiring activities is also a very important component of this strategy. And certainly finally, but not lastly, the retention piece amongst the labor market constraints that we're seeing right now, it is more expensive than ever for you to lose on the key talent, especially people with a lot of experience and a lot of know-how. You've got to implement programs like tangible, meaningful things that engage your, your people and assess what they feel, uh, encourage them to openly and honestly tell you what they think about the organization, particularly on areas that cause them pain and they would like to see improvement. And then it's not just enough to ask, but you have to listen and act to give them the things that they need. All three of these areas we're going to explore in more detail in future webinars. But the, the, the key element that I want you to understand here is that uh, uh, an effective talent strategy is going to be um, coming up short unless you have all three of these pillars addressed. The last point that I wanted to make for you today is this idea that when you are in a war for talent, you cannot go at it alone. You can't go into this combat unarmed. And so you need partners and you need good ammunition. And I believe that a lot of um, companies still think of recruiters as uh, something that is um, a, a negative thing. And the reality is I didn't know much about this myself prior to joining Miller Resource Group about six months ago. And I've done some really uh, interesting research in this field. And, and I have seen firsthand that some organizations still have kind of this stigma when it comes to recruiting. But the message that I want to communicate to you is not all recruiters are the same. First and foremost, you have to understand this is a massive industry. U.S. recruiting was $140 billion in 2020. But within that group, there's the likes of job boards and placement sites like Monster and Indeed and um, uh, the, the like. But those are not what I'm talking about when I say recruiting. What I'm talking about are specifically the search and placement firms that can come in and be a partner for you. They can actually go out into the marketplace. They can uh, focus on hiring active talent uh, uh, and, and passive talent. They can really pitch the message of your business, why your company with your people and your products is, and the mission that you have is the right answer and really hope to attract at the end of the day, the passive candidates that not, are not just actively looking for work and peppering the entire internet with their resume, but the ones that are potentially open to having a conversation, but are, would never actually apply with your organization until they were engaged to do so. So you can see here, it's a much smaller uh, portion of recruiting overall. And there are organizations that think of recruiters as a business partner, someone who is critical to the success of the business. This is according to a CEO of one Fortune 500 firm. And I think that you have to open your mind to the fact that 
having a partner in this war for talent is going to be a very beneficial thing for you. Yes, it comes with a cost, but the effectiveness and the efficiency of a recruiter, it, it, I liken this to the, uh, to the housing market. Most of you, if you were buying or selling a home, would never think about doing so on your own. You would work with a realtor who knows the market, lives and breathes it every single day, and they would be able to know what to do, where to go, how to get all the information, how to fill out all the forms appropriately, how to talk to the buyers and the sellers, depending on what side of the transaction you were on. And we are willing to pay these folks a fee for helping us navigate the very complex nature that is the housing market. The same idea has to be applied to recruiting. A, a relationship with a, a, a good recruiting organization, whether it's Miller Resource Group or any other one that you want to work with, I think is paramount to success because the right recruiter is not just someone that's going to put up job postings and send you candidates. They're going to be an advisor, a talent advisor that can actually help you in the entirety of the talent strategy spectrum. That's certainly what we're hoping to do here at Miller Resource Group. So the key elements that I wanted to share with you today is the job market and workforce issues in general are completely different now than they were even a short two years ago. And you have to adapt, you have to evolve, and you have to challenge yourself to really ask the, the tough questions and then change when change needs to, be, uh, needs to be had. So with that, I wanted to make sure that we leave some time for Q&A on the back end. So Joanna, I will go over back over to you and I'm happy to answer some questions. Absolutely, we've got a, a number of questions. Um, one in particular goes back to the slide about um, the unemployment rate of 3.9%. Uh, essentially, who's missing from that 3.9%? It, it seems like there are more individuals, you know, again, that we hear of, that percentage seems a, a little low. Yeah, it's, it's really a great, um, great catch in terms of whoever noticed that. And I will say that uh, it's a complex answer, but um, the, the, I would say there are three key elements. First and foremost, we clearly see that the uh, retirement of baby boomers has accelerated during uh, the pandemic, and it, it's still at much higher levels than normal today. So typically, on average, you have about 10,000 uh, people per day going into retirement in the United States. Last year, the uh, amount of people that were classified as retiring by uh, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics was 4.4 million. So that represents somewhere between a 10 and 20 percent increase over a typical retirement year. Year, and accounts for several hundred thousand of the missing workers that you see here uh, in the discrepancy between the pre-pandemic and the post-pandemic period. Uh, another um, statistic that I will uh, leverage to explain this is having to do with entrepreneurship. So uh, a lot of people have really reassessed what work means to them. They uh, were fearful before the pandemic, but uh, because of the stress levels that they've endured, they're actually able to take on a little bit more risk. And they said, why don't I try? This may be the perfect time for me to start a business. So not only are we seeing a, a um, filing of new business applications with the Small Business Administration nearly double. Like it's, it's, it's significantly higher than it was in the years prior to the pandemic. But you have to understand this has a, a two-sided effect. The first is all of those people that leave traditional W-2 or 1099 positions are now working for themselves. And they're also putting up job openings and trying to hire people. So um, th this is a, a kind of a knock-on effect. So I would say retirement number one, uh, the starting of new businesses at a much higher rate than it was uh, prior to the pandemic is number two. And then the third element is uh, probably a combination. So uh, there are folks that decided to go back to school during this period of time. There are folks that uh, are still fearful that the results, uh, you know, the, the, the various health risks to them are too great. Uh, and so they're hesitant to come back to the job market as it, is, as it stands today. And when you add those two, three together, then you're likely looking at the vast majority of this two plus million dollar difference in the pre and the post pandemic labor force statistics. Gotcha. Thank you, Alex. We had a question come in through chat. Is there a way to quantify the hit your company takes when they lose top talent as a way to figure out how you might need to adjust compensation in the event that you're hesitant to do so? 
Yes, there absolutely is a way. It's one of the things that I have uh, been helping a lot of companies with. I think the key element here is you have to be a data-driven decision maker. And the kind of data that you use is also quite important. For example, one of the things that I did when I joined the Miller Resource Group is I established a partnership between us and a company called Labor IQ, which provides very timely, very accurate and current uh, compensation data. Now, uh, typically for individual companies, the entry point is probably prohibitive from a financial perspective, but one of the advisory elements that we do is when you have an open position, I can actually take the requirements of the job, meaning what education level, how many years of experience, the specific nature of your company, how many employees, how many, uh, how much revenue do you uh, have, um, you know, how, uh, how big of the business it really is, and the key element is what is the location of the job? And what is the vertical market, meaning the NAICS code or, or the industry that you're in? And the, the platform allows me to understand not only what is the median or the average income for that particular position, but also what the recommended range is in terms of what kind of an offer do you need to make in order to have a good shot of landing a candidate in this market? And the reason why this tool, I think, is very powerful is because it actually validates all of the wage data against something like 8 million W-2s on an ongoing basis. So it's not just a modeled approach, they actually see what people are making and are able to make accurate recommendations that allow companies to go into the conversation feeling confident and knowing that the offer that they're going to be making is competitive given today's very tight labor market dynamics. It doesn't just stop there though. You can also apply the same idea to the install base or, or what I call the existing workforce. But the, essentially you can use this platform to ascertain which of your people are getting underpaid, which represent the biggest risk to your organization from a attrition and a potential leaving for more money perspective and proactively have conversations with these people in terms of making sure that they feel heard and also that there is a plan in place to get them to what is a fair market wage if they're not there right now. That doesn't mean that you have to immediately flip the switch and, uh, and raise their, their compensation by that amount. But if you have that conversation and they know that it's a process that the company is a partner for me, we're working on this together, then they're much less likely to just bail on you when a higher offer comes along. So I know that was a bit long-winded, but I hope it helps. Uh, Alex, we have another question. Um, sure. does, more, does more entrepreneurship mean we should consider more alternate forms of getting work done? i.e. less full-time positions and more contracts, outsourcing, et cetera. I think that's a very astute observation and it, it really pinpoints a key element of a successful talent strategy, which is flexibility. You absolutely do need to increase the amount of flexibility in the business. That doesn't mean just rolling over and giving your people exactly what they're asking for, but you have to, again, engage them in that conversation, understand what their needs are. I mean, if you look at your employee base, some people will be driven by compensation. Others will value the ability to work remotely a few days a week greatly. Others are looking for the camaraderie of the team element and the ability to grow in terms of uh, progressing in their career. Others just really want to focus on the challenge of the work itself. So if you don't ask those questions and understand what the motivational factors are, then you're not going to be able to give the people what they want. But I think that the key element is when they tell you what you what they want, you have to be flexible. And you can't say, well, we've never done that before, so we're not going to start now. You have to really look deep inside of yourself and ask, how can we make that happen? If this is important to this individual, then it's likely going to be important to several others as well. So what can we do? And again, if you approach this conversation as more of a, we're on equal grounds, we're partners in this, rather than the traditional, I'm the employer, I get to tell you what to do, and you're the employee, kind of this, uh, this more traditional power structure, then I think that that's a huge part of building a solid culture at your company for people feeling heard and for the retention of the staff to, to, to go up substantially. And Alex, we're gonna take just one more question and then we'll need to um, wrap up, but we've got several good ones. So sure. question is, what tips would you give to picking and working with a recruiter and how do you learn to, to trust that recruiter? That's a fantastic question. So um, I, I'll just apply my own litmus test. I think that the conversation needs to be focused on asking questions. A good recruiter is not someone that's just looking to check the box. They really need to understand 
who you are as an organization, what your short-term and long-term goals are, what is the ideal candidate that you're looking for, and in terms of what kind of lifestyle does that person need to have. I'll give you a good example. Uh, we're working with a company right now to replace a na national sales manager for them. And one of the first things that my colleague, who's a recruiter, asked the hiring authority was, you know, I'd love to talk to someone in a similar role at your organization to understand really what is the day-to-day -day like? What is it like? Are they working primarily with distributors or are they selling to manufacturers? Because the relationship building and the amount of travel really reflects the two different types of approach. So asking a lot of questions, you know, make sure that they are really seeking to understand, um, you know, not only the immediate need, but the broader picture is key. I think they need to be competitive uh, with the rest of the market. Um, I would be wary of the people that are really trying to get away on the cheap in terms of, you know, if you look at um, typical rates from what I've been able to uh, uncover in the recruitment industry, vary somewhere between 20% and upwards of 40% of first year base comp as a fee for uh, placing a person within your organization. So um, a lot of times that's a negotiating point, but the companies that readily agree to be the cheapest in the room, you'll typically get what you pay for. So you wanna find someone that you can, uh, you feel good about through a conversation that um, starts small, I would say. Don't just immediately ask them to fill all of the open positions, work with them on one or two positions, see how good they are, see how responsive they are in terms of the communication. And I think that that's the key element. The quality of candidates that they present to you will be the best barometer for success. If you feel like these guys really understood what you convey to them and are bringing the people that match your vision for what, what the employee in this position is going to be, then that's a good partner for you. So again, sorry for the long-winded response, but I'm very passionate about this and are great partners in recruiting organizations out there. I hope you were able to find one. If you don't have one off the top of your head, certainly give us a call. We'll, we'll happily talk to you. All right. Um, I, we're going to take, um, and hopefully this, well, I don't know if this will be a, a short answer or not, but we can take to 335 and then we're, we're absolutely done. Um, okay. I, I think this question is, is good. Um, what do you predict, when do you predict job openings will stabilize? Is this a short-term issue or are we in a long-term recovery? So I'll put uh, uh, my, my economic lenses back on and we'll say that there's really, uh, from all of the variety of sources that I've seen, very few people expect another recession prior to the kind of the mid 2020s or so. So I would say two to three years of stable economic growth, probably at a slower pace than what we've seen in 2021, but uh, certainly positive growth nonetheless, that will persist. The uh, um, nature of the job market really, uh, as I mentioned already has changed, but you can see it in the type of jobs being advertised. Prior to the start of the pandemic, only about 4% of all the jobs listed on monster.com had a remote element to them. Now it's one in six or roughly speaking 16%. So I think that as long as the economy is good, as long as there are uh, these options available to people, and as long as um, the, the economic growth sustains more, again, the entrepreneurship, I think as long as the stock market remains relatively healthy, people will be likely to retire at a faster pace. So I, in the next two to three years, I really don't see these dynamics changing significantly. And that's why it's important to not just think immediate short term, but implement a behavioral change, a, uh, put it into practice for a strategic approach to medium and long term talent strategy as well. Alex, thank you so much for the presentation today. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you that um, have joined us in this live session. Just wanted to let you know, because we've had a lot of questions about whether or not Alex's presentation will be available or the uh, recording will be available. Yes, tomorrow, um, your respective associations will receive both. Uh, and typically, um, they post uh, these recordings are posted to your association's website. Um, and we will ask them to distribute the um, PDF of the PowerPoint for you so you've got that information. Also too, tomorrow we really, uh, you'll receive an email that'll have a link to an evaluation. We would love to have your feedback. Um, please, uh, uh, you know, give us your comments. We do hope to see you um, for part two of this series, which is Wednesday, April 20th. Uh, and during that particular webinar, we'll talk about identifying the key elements 
that make your organization attractive to top talent. And I know that was really the crux of a couple of questions that we did not get to today. So we hope that you'll join us for that April 20th webinar. And again, identifying the key elements that make an association attractive to top talent. So until then, again, thank you very much for your participation and hope you have a great rest of your week. Take care.